Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for being here after yesterday night, Margaritas. So uh, this is a joint work with uh, Margarita, Andrea, uh, Ignacio, and uh, Alfredo. Does this work? Yes. So let's start with a simple example. We have school admission. Uh, on the left, there are some schools. On the right, we have some students. Um, in this example, we assume that every school has capacity one. And uh, of course, every student can be assigned at most of one school. Uh, school rank uh, students and students rank schools. Um, so independently on the stable matching that we choose, even if we choose the best stable matching for the students, which is the student optimal stable matching, we have that unfortunately, Bob remains unassigned. So <laughs> that's a big problem. How do we tackle this problem? So luckily in the real world, there are uh, or some institutions or some private foundation that provide some extra capacities. So you get a capacity. So <laughs> the question is, to whom should we assign this extra capacity? To which institutions, which schools? Let's try to see uh, how this works in our previous example. Let's, try, let's start from top left. If we allocate one extra capacity to school C, then nothing changes. If we allocate, and let's go clockwise, we allocate one extra capacity to school M, Lee, who was previously assigned to school C, improves his own assignment and gets uh, into school M. Um, bottom right, we allocate one extra capacity to school Q. Again, nothing changes. Finally, if we allocate instead one extra capacity to school Q, uh, D, sorry, uh, we have that finally Bob manages to get enrolled. Uh, so why did we choose this problem? Why is this problem important? Well. Of course, because it provides, so tackling this question, exploring this question, uh, will provide a tool to policymakers to understand, to measure how to assign extra funding to schools. And not only that, because the beauty of this model is that it is sufficiently general that it allows to be applied to many other different applications in the real world. For example, managing extra resources for refugee resettlement or even healthcare rationing. So, we are hopefully getting out of a pandemic. Uh, so imagine like uh, uh, the central government obtaining some extra uh, ventilators that they should be distributed, that should be distributed to hospitals. So to which hospitals should the, this ventilator be assigned to? Um, so the plan of the talk is we'll provide a model. We'll show that the model we provide is sufficiently flexible to be adapted to several uh, real world uh, situation, uh, and then we we'll, uh, provide some exact and approximate methods. So let's dive into the model. Again, the problem is we have some extra capacities. The question is, how should we assign this extra capacity to ameliorate the most the outcome for the students? Uh, these are the underneath model assumptions. We have a bipartite graph uh, with a set of students, uh, a set of schools, uh, a profile of strict preferences uh, and a capacity function. We assume that every student has capacity uh, at, at most one. Um, we have stability condition, which is a, a standard uh, base uh, kind of fairness condition. And we have a budget uh, over the extra capacities that we can allocate to schools. Um, so we have set the constraints to our problem. What is the measure? that we want to use? What is the objective function? What we choose is the sum of the rankings of the schools in which students are being enrolled according to their own preferences, of course. But it may happen, and we call this, this is usually called the cost of the matching for the students. So we have a problem. As we saw in the initial example, not all the students may be enrolled. So what we, do we do for the students who are not enrolled? Indeed, what we do instead of taking the ranking uh, of a phantom university or a school, um, we take in consideration a penalty. Um, and every student will have a penalty for not being assigned. Why did we choose this measure, this objective function? Well, there is a fault theorem, we also provide a proof of it, um, that establishes that when we minimize the cost of the student, uh, then we obtain the student optimal stable matching under the stability condition, of course. So this turns out to be the formulation of our problem. We have a minimization 
two kinds of variables. We have the variable T, which is the allocation of extra capacities, and the variable me, which is the uh, matching. Uh, the variable T, the sum of the entries, which should be integer, cannot uh, be greater than the budget, of course. The matching should be stable in the expanded instance according to the vector of extra capacities. And of course, the objective is the sum of the ranking and the penalties. Let's see um, how our model can be adapted into several real world situations. So the question now is, what is the meaning of the penalty? What is the role of the penalty in your model? Let's try to see that in some example on a real world data set. Let's start with a very little value of the penalty. Let's take a value close to zero. What happens? So let's run some experiments together on the Chilean school admission data set from 2018. Uh, these, uh, we took the section of the pre-kindergarten because it's the biggest one um, in the Magallanes region, which is the southernmost region in uh, Chile. Uh, 43 schools, uh, 1,400 students approximately. Every student has a preference list of length uh, three or four, something like that. Um, so here, uh, the penalty for having an, an assigned student, these are, these are children, is the length of the preference list plus one. So the plot in the x-axis, we have the size of the budget, so we, ag we augment it. And on the y-axis, we have the number of students. So the red line um, represents the number of students who, uh, as a consequence of allocating optimally the extra capacities, they get, uh, they improve their own assignment inside of the matching. So it is the students who are already assigned without extra capacities. And as a consequence of the alloc optimal allocation of extra capacities, they improve their own matching. The blue line instead represents the students who, as a consequence of allocating optimally the extra capacities, they manage to enter the matching. So as we see with a very low penalty, we have that the model will tend to prioritize the improvement of students rather than the entry of new students into the matching. So, so the question is, on the spectrum, what happens if we start to increase the budget? And what we see is that the phenomenon of before flips, meaning that as we augment the value of the penalty, we see that students who previously were not enrolled managed to get the priority. Uh, of being assigned into new schools. Um, so what we saw is that uh, experimentally for a low value of the penalty, the model will tend to prioritize the improvement of new students uh, who are already into the matching. And we call this phenomenon improvement. Otherwise, if we have a very high value of the penalty, then the model will tend to allocate these extra capacities in a way to prioritize the entry of new students into the matching. So the question is, is this something only, uh, so, something that we can see only experimentally? Or can we also draw some conclusions, some benchmarks by looking at the structure of the problem? So luckily the answer is yes. <laughs> um, so for a very low penalty uh, equal to zero or less, we have the guarantee that the number of students who will uh, improve their own position will be greater than the number of students who enter the matching question. So this is the case for, the improvement, for improvement. So we have a, guarant a theoretical guarantee for the penalty in the improvement case. Can we say something similar for the access case? Uh, yes or no? Well, almost. <laughs> um, indeed, what we know is that there is a sufficiently large penalty, I didn't write the number because it's an ugly number, um, for which the model will choose an allocation that yields the maximum cardinality, student optimal, stable matching. Unfortunately, uh, because of the structure of the problem, there are some instances that tells us that basically we cannot all the time guarantee that uh, independently of the, um, um, of the of the, of the penalty there is a, that we can guarantee that the number of students who enter will be greater than the number of students who improve. So 
how did we uh, compute these results? So there is an extensive literature in mathematical programming um, on the school choice uh, problem. So we adapt uh, our, formula, our problem to this formulation. Thanks. Um, so again, uh, we have a minimization. We have two variables. The variable x is the variable for the matching and the variable t is for the allocation of extra capacities. The sum is the sum of uh, the rankings or the penalties. The first two constraints are the capacity constraints for the student and for the schools. The third constraints, I highlighted a couple of the, the two variables. So unfortunately, uh, it's a quadratic constraint, which poses some um, strong computational uh, boundaries. Um, it means that it's tough to compute. Uh, so what we do is that we provide some McCormick linearizations. Uh, we theoretically prove that one of our linearizations outperform all the others, uh, well, the other. Um, and we also uh, run some experiments on uh, artificial instances that we generated with, uh, in this case is with uh, um, uniform preferences. So this is the performance profile. We have one hour time limit, uh, 1,400 instances. And uh, as we see the aggregated linearization, which is our best linearization, outperforms the integer quadratic programming model. So uh, at this point, I, I guess and I hope that to some of you, uh, it is clear that this problem is tough to solve. Uh, uh, bad news, uh, it is not only tough to solve, it is very tough. Uh, so we proved in another paper that um, it is not approximable within a constant factor, uh, almost a constant factor. So um, this justifies the, the cast for uh, heuristics. <laughs> uh, we provide a couple of heuristics. Uh, the first one is a kind of LP-based heuristic, meaning that uh, we take the original model I showed you uh, before. Uh, we relax it from the stability condition, meaning we take out the stability constraints. Uh, and from it, we get uh, an allocation vector. So basically, we get an allocation vector from a, a facility location problem. Um, with that allocation vector, we expand the instance, and then we run the gale shapley aggregate, the deferred acceptance one. Uh, the second heuristic um, is uh, uh, an, an, an iterative uh, application of the, gale, uh, of the deferred acceptance algorithm. So basically, we take one unit of budget at a time, and we allocate it accordingly to the best uh, school uh, for the, um, that, that we get. Um, so these are the results on the x-axis. Again, we have the um, capacities that augment. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage gap. Uh, the greedy approach performed better with um, smaller amount of capacities, uh, while the LPH base manages to have a more steady performance. Uh, so that's it. The, to conclude, they, we addressed uh, the following question, so how should policymaker um, allocate extra capacities? And we provide a model that is sufficiently flexible to be adapted to many real-world situations. So, for example, we want, uh, there is uh, a social uh, value uh, for, uh, that is low, for example, for having unassigned students. Uh, so, in this case, we have improvement. Or, for example, we have a social value uh, of having unassigned students, for example, elementary school kids. Uh, then we absolutely need to prioritize access. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have the time, but we also prove in the paper that uh, under certain conditions, the model is strategy proof for the students. And uh, interestingly, there are some situations in which it is not even strategy proof for the students. So this poses some very interesting questions for policymakers. Uh, yeah, and finally, we provide some exact and approximate computational methods. Thank you. I'm here for your questions. Thank you. Uh, th thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, I had a question about the Falk uh, uh, the theorem, oh, yeah. the one you mentioned. Yeah. So let's say that the cost is very high to being yeah. unassigned. Yeah. Then you may be interested in finding a stable matching that is assigned as many 
applicants as possible if the cost of unassigned is too high. Yeah. And you say that you can just look at the student op optimal one because it would be do better. So, so the, the thing is that um, the, the, the very nice thing of this uh, theorem um, is that basically um, it guarantees that every time we do the minimization, we will always get the student optimal stable matching. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to uh, worry about that, basically. Yeah, that's a good Because if it's a, another one, you can just get Pareto improvement. Everybody's Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And my, my second question, if I may, is uh, like in, in, in reality, it may be that you, you may, you can only uh, change the capacity by two or three or four, right? It may not be too much. In that case, can you solve the problem by Oh, that's course? a fantastic question. Uh, it's a very beautiful question. So there are, um, yeah, this definitely, um, we, we are going to print very soon, like a version in which we have also, we are including also this constraint. So we just need to include some constraints. But the problem is that uh, in, in the theoretical paper that we have, we still prove that uh, is very, very hard uh, as a problem. If you want, I can show you again the picture. Oh. <laughs> I mean, if we don't have any more questions, then we're a bit behind on time. So yeah, of course. Okay. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe that's a bit uh, extending the scope, but have you thought about um, losing a bit on stability and then? maximizing the matching yeah 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 this is uh, an excellent question so actually um these are very nice question um so the point is that when we um yeah here um when we assign this kind of cost function uh the interesting thing is that somehow since we are ma minimizing uh for the cost of the students um like my understanding so I may be wrong, and please, if you think I'm wrong, uh, let's keep talking about this offline later on. But my understanding is that basically, uh, the stability condition what ensures in this setting, in the way we formulate the problem, um, is that somehow it takes in consideration the preferences of the schools that otherwise uh, we wouldn't take in consideration. Um, so somehow a part of the stability condition is already included uh, in this case, uh, not all of it, but in part, into the cost uh, function. Um, so somehow I think to answer to your question, that is why um, this, uh, the LP based uh, heuristic manages to uh, remain so faithful to the real optimal value because it manages to keep track of what the preferences of the students really are, but somehow it forgets what are the preferences of the schools, uh, but it forgets it simply because it never knew about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks yes, a lot. Yeah.